In August of 1781, a fleet of 28 French ships of the line, under the command of Rear Admiral Francois de Grasse, dropped anchor inside the entrance to Chesapeake Bay off the coast of Virginia. The fleet had come at the request of General George Washington, who was anxious for French naval support in his siege of British General Earl Cornwallis's army on the nearby Yorktown Peninsula. Washington knew that these French ships were the key to his success in the Yorktown campaign, and perhaps in the entire war. If they could successfully cut Cornwallis's supply line to the sea, it would free him and French General Lafayette to press home their attack and defeat Britain's best army in the colonies. Meanwhile, the British naval commander in American waters, Rear Admiral Thomas Graves, was heading for Chesapeake Bay with a fleet of 19 ships of the line. Unaware of de Grasse's presence, Graves intended to reinforce Cornwallis with supplies and 2,000 fresh troops. On September 5th, Graves' fleet spotted the French lying at anchor along the southern shore of Chesapeake Bay. De Grasse had recently detached four of his vessels and his fleet now numbered 24 ships of the line, five more than Graves. However, Graves had all the advantages of position, wind, tide, and surprise. But instead of immediately pouncing on the unprepared French, Graves wasted precious time by deploying his fleet into a line-ahead formation as mandated by the fighting instructions. Since their adoption over 100 years before, linear tactics had served the British Navy extremely well. The line ahead allowed a clear field of fire for all the ships in a fleet. In an age when the only way for ships to communicate was by signal flags, which could easily be obscured by sails or the smoke of battle, it also gave each captain clear and simple instructions to hold his place in line and focus his fire on the enemy craft opposite his own. But by dictating what a commander could and could not do, linear tactics also stifled individual initiative and boldness of action. And with the ponderous sailing qualities of the British ships of the line, it was a painfully slow process for a squadron to assemble into a line of battle. By the time Graves' fleet had formed its line, de Grasse had managed to set his sails and put to sea, escaping what could have been a deadly British trap. The French fleet then formed its own line of battle just outside of Chesapeake Bay. But de Grasse had no intention of risking his ships in an all-out engagement with the more rugged British vessels. Instead, he used a classic French tactic to frustrate Graves' efforts to close in for the kill. That was to instruct his gunners to aim high at the spars, masts, and rigging of the British ships, thereby crippling their ability to maneuver effectively. The British uh, placed a high premium on trying to destroy the enemy's hull, to cause damage, uh, dismast them, and, and so forth, where the French, for example, tended to shoot uh, their cannonballs higher up. So they timed their broadsides on the upswing rather than downswing of the ship and tried to destroy the rigging and the sails. Once his fleet had damaged the British ships, de Grasse used the superior speed and maneuverability of his ships of the line to confound his enemies again. The wily French admiral led Graves on a six-day chase, slowing when the British fell behind, speeding up when they drew too close, always remaining near but just out of reach. Basically playing footsie tempting Graves to action, then doing the classic French thing, which is, you know, you, you, you make for it and then you haul off. And the British saying, we've got to close, we've got to close, we've got to close, you know, to be able to hit these people, to smash them, and the French doing their usual trick of keeping away from it, firing at spars, not wishing to make an issue of it. So they chase each other around for about four to six days, and eventually, uh, you know, with a, with, a, with a degree of damage on both sides and quite a lot to, to Graves' rigging, the French go back inside the Chesapeake. De Grasse's brilliant maneuvers decoyed the British, while another squadron of eight French ships of the line slipped into Chesapeake Bay to land crucial reinforcements and heavy artillery for Washington's forces. This new French squadron then joined with De Grasse's fleet to blockade Yorktown. Now faced with an overwhelming French force of 32 ships of the line, Graves had no choice but to withdraw to the safety of his base in New York. By the time his reinforced fleet set sail for Yorktown again, it was too late. Cornwallis had surrendered. The war would continue for another year, 
but the back of English military power in America had been broken. This was the lesson that the Navy learned from the American war, that it wasn't enough to draw a battle. It, it was no good having an inconclusive skirmish, you know, and then everybody retreating to port and coming back and trying again the next day or on another occasion. The Navy learned that the consequences of, of failure to close an enemy and destroy it could be strategically catastrophic. This action off Chesapeake Bay, called the Battle of the Virginia Capes, was one of the most important and least appreciated naval engagements of all time. Even though he had sunk only one British vessel, the tactical brilliance of Admiral de Grasse and the Royal Navy's slavish devotion to the line ahead formation had ensured the defeat of the British Army and played a vital role in the birth of a new nation. Yet even as the French and Americans were celebrating their victory, an amateur British naval tactician who had never even been to sea was already promoting a new set of tactics that would once again vault the Royal Navy's ships of the line to supremacy. 